This video has been sponsored by NordVPN, which is an excellent service that helps keep your data and private information safe on the internet. They're giving all my viewers 77% off a three-year plan, so if you want to support my channel, you should definitely sign up by going to nordvpn.com slash nilred, or by clicking the link in the description. Several weeks ago, I made indigo dye, and I talked about how it was practically insoluble in water. So to dye clothing with it, I had to do a unique process where it was converted back and forth between a soluble and insoluble form. This was done by exploiting the fact that indigo has two main forms, an insoluble oxidized one that is blue, and a reduced one which is colorless but soluble. I set up a chemical bath with reducing agents, which allowed me to dissolve the indigo. I soaked a pair of jeans in it, and when I took it out, it quickly started getting oxidized by the air and becoming blue again. In my opinion, this process was pretty cool, and if you haven't seen the video already, I suggest checking it out. It isn't necessary to watch before this one though. In any case, besides using this method to make indigo soluble, it's also possible to do it through chemical modification. By adding some groups to it which are more water friendly, it's possible to greatly increase its solubility. There are probably many ways to do this, but the most common way is to just add sulfonate groups to make a new dye called indigo carmine. In water, indigo carmine gives a very rich blue color, and it's approved in the US and Europe as a food additive. In the US and Canada, it's referred to as FD&C blue number no. 2, or just blue 2, and in Europe, it's E132. Once I make the indigo carmine, I'm going to do some tests that I think are cool, and then I'll dye some food with it. In terms of chemicals, I'll be using the indigo that I made in that previous video, sulfuric acid that I distilled myself from drain cleaner, and non-iodized salt that I got from the grocery store. It was really hard to find a proper procedure to make the indigo carmine, and all I had to go on was this single forum post. It was decent enough, but it really wasn't detailed, and I ended up running into a bunch of issues. I managed to sort them all out, but it made the process quite messy, and my yield was definitely impacted. When I was done, I considered refilming the whole thing, but I decided not to, for reasons I'll explain later in the video. To start things off, I added 30 mils of concentrated sulfuric acid, followed by 2.5 grams of indigo. The indigo is soluble in the concentrated acid, so I just let it stir here until it looked like it all dissolved. Then, I placed it in a boiling water bath for about 30 minutes. What I'm doing here is reacting the indigo with the sulfuric acid to make indigo disulfonic acid as the major product. However, to a certain extent, I'll probably also make some tri and tetra substituted ones. The number of sulfonic acids that are ultimately added depends entirely on the reaction conditions, i.e. the temperature, the acid strength, and the reaction time. Under these particular conditions though, it's supposed to pretty much only make the dye substituted product. However, if it's left longer than 30 minutes, the other products would probably start showing up. So 30 minutes later, I took it out, and I immediately poured it into 150 mils of cold water. It was very important to use cold water here, because adding sulfuric acid to water generates a lot of heat. It can sometimes cause spontaneous boiling and splashing, and it's especially an issue if the acid's already hot. In any case, the major purpose of this step is to stop the reaction. It only really occurs in concentrated acid, so by diluting it here, I'm basically locking it in at the dye substituted product and preventing those other ones from forming. On top of this, all the water also precipitates any unreacted indigo. I washed the beaker a couple times with water, and I let it stir here for several minutes. Then I moved on to filtering it to get rid of the unreacted indigo. When everything had passed through, I washed the beaker and the filter with a small amount of water. The original solution was so concentrated that it looked black, but this washing diluted things a little, and the nice blue color really started to become evident. The flask was moved to a stir plate, and I dropped in a stir bar. I turned on strong stirring, and then I dumped in 30 grams of non-iodized table salt. I managed to get this salt locally, but it was honestly quite hard to find. The salt that's sold at most stores is iodized, and it would probably work fine, but it does introduce impurities. In any case, when the salt was added, it reacted with the indigo disulfonic acid to form the corresponding disodium salt, which is the indigo carmine, as well as hydrochloric acid. 
Some of the salt also reacted with leftover sulfuric acid to make hydrochloric acid and sodium sulfate. A large excess of salt was used here to not only make sure it could react with everything, but to also separate the indigo carmine from the solution through something called the common ion effect. I don't want to get into too much detail, but basically, both indigo carmine and sodium chloride have a sodium ion in common, but the sodium chloride is way more soluble. By filling the solution with so many extra sodium ions, it makes it harder for the indigo carmine to dissolve, and it ends up precipitating out. I continued stirring it until all the salt disappeared, which took a few minutes. At this point though, it didn't look like there was any indigo carmine separating out. However, it was still a bit warm, so I put it in the fridge overnight and hoped that it would appear. In the morning, I was really happy to see that a bunch of solid had formed. I dumped it all into my vacuum filter, but it ended up kind of being a pain. When I turned on my pump, it initially seemed to be working, but after a few minutes, it got completely blocked. When this happens, I've found that it actually works better to just do a gravity filtration through something like a coffee filter. I tried my best to get everything out of the filter flask, but it was honestly pretty messy. I ended up just washing it a few times with a small amount of water and scooping the rest out with my finger. I was able to get out pretty much all of it, but there was still some left behind. I also rinsed the original flask with some water and dumped that on top. I let it sit there to filter through, and about 5 hours later, this is what I was left with. To finish drying it, I took it out of the strainer, and I put it on some paper towel. I also set up a fan off screen, to try to speed it up. The next day, it should have been completely dry, but it was still kind of pasty. I started separating it from the filter, but I had to be careful because it had become quite weak. I kind of expected this though, because I wasn't able to give it a proper washing step yet, and there's still a bunch of leftover acid that attacks the paper. What's interesting is that it actually turned out to be a good thing, that it was still kind of wet. I found that if it had completely dried, it would have just stuck to the filter, and been impossible to remove. I was able to separate pretty much all of it after just a few minutes, but there were still some that stayed stuck to the filter. The dye is really dark, so it kind of looks like it's a decent amount, but it actually wasn't very much. I transferred it all to a glass dish, and then it was time to clean it up. Ideally, it would just be washed with water, but since indigo carmine is soluble in water, it isn't ideal. The guy on the forum said to wash it with a saturated salt solution, but that would mean there would be salt left in my final product. I wanted it to be as clean as possible, so I decided to wash it with methanol instead. I went with methanol because it dries faster, it can remove small amounts of salt, and it would also pull out residual water. Indigo carmine isn't very soluble in it, but I still used as little as possible. I then mixed it around with a spatula, and I broke up all the chunks. I occasionally added small amounts of methanol, and I was eventually left with this goop. I dumped it into a coffee filter, and I washed the dish with some more methanol. Like before, I let almost all of it pass through, and then I moved it to some paper towel. After 40 minutes, most of the methanol had evaporated, and I carefully moved all the indigo carmine back to the dish. I spread out the paste to help it dry, and over the next 6 hours, it completely solidified. I broke it up into pieces, and this was the result. There was a whole bunch of white stuff mixed in it, and I think this was just salt. It was a lot more than I expected there to be, and it was pretty clear that methanol wasn't the best choice here. There weren't many options though, and it seemed like the only way to really get rid of the salt was to just suck it up and to wash it with water. While indigo carmine does dissolve in water, it's not that soluble, and only about a gram will dissolve in 100 mils. So I figured that if I used at most 10 mils of water, I would lose about 0.1 grams here, which I was okay with. I added it all to a filter, washed the dish thoroughly with a small amount of water, and then added that on top. I mixed it around for a few minutes, and I made sure that there were no chunks left. I turned on my pump to pull off the water, but as expected, it went through really slowly. The filter getting blocked here though, isn't as big of an issue compared to last time, because the volume of water that I need to pass through, isn't nearly as much. In all honesty, I should have just used a coffee filter again, but for some reason I was really optimistic that this filter funnel would work. Anyway, I ended up washing it three separate times and used a total of 10 mils.
After the last one, I left the pump on for about 10 minutes to try to dry it up as much as possible. Then, just using my finger, I scraped it all out and put it on a small filter paper. I left it out to dry overnight with a fan, and this is what I was left with in the morning. It was almost completely dry and stuck to the paper, so unfortunately to get it off, I had to wet it again. I waited a few minutes for it to really soak in, and then I separated it like before. I put it all back onto my trusty dish, and I waited for it to dry. Over the next day or so, I occasionally poked at it and broke it into pieces, and this is what I was left with. Based on appearances alone, it looked like I was successful at getting rid of the salt, so I was pretty happy about that. The final yield here was 2.8 grams, which represents a percent yield of 63%, so not exactly amazing. I imagine that most of the product loss just comes from all the transferring steps as well as the washings. If I were to do this again, I would just wash it with a small amount of water after the first filtering step, and that would be it. I also wouldn't try vacuum filtering it at all, and I would just stick with the coffee filters. At this point, I considered refilming everything and just showing you guys a polished version, but in the end, I decided not to. And no, it's not just because it would have been a lot of extra work. When I can, I like to show the issues that I run into, because I feel it gives a more realistic view of chemistry. Some sort of problem is always popping up, and it's all about figuring out how to deal with it. In my opinion, it's also the most exciting and interesting part, because it actually allows me to apply my own ideas and knowledge. Anyway, the dye at this point was probably quite pure, but because this is an edible chem, I wanted to do at least one proper purification step. I looked online, but I couldn't really find any info on the best way to do this. I tried recrystallizing it from water and other solvents, but it just didn't seem to work very well. In the end though, this is what I ended up doing. I added it all to a beaker, followed by 300 ml of water. I turned on the stirring and I mixed it for like 20 minutes, just to make sure that it all dissolved. I passed it through a coffee filter to separate out any insoluble junk, and then I dumped it into an equal amount of food grade isopropanol. The indigo carmine's nearly insoluble in it, so it caused it to precipitate out. I gave it a thorough mixing, cooled it in the fridge, and then filtered it again. When there was just a slime left, I took out the filter and transferred everything to a clean bowl. I set up a fan off screen to help it dry, and this is what it looked like the next day. I scraped it all off using a razor blade, and in my opinion, the product was really nice. When I weighed it though, it was a pathetic 0.9 grams. I think it is possible to get out nearly all the indigo carmine, but I just didn't have enough isopropanol to do it. So I ended up doing a 1 to 1 ratio, but I think the ideal is more of a 3 to 1, or maybe even a 4 or 5 to 1. The amount that I got was still more than enough though, so I was pretty happy with it. Just to test it out, I added a small amount to some water, and I thought that it was kind of mesmerizing. When I was done looking at it, I turned on the stirring, and waited for everything to dissolve. Then, I dumped in some sodium hydroxide. I let it just sit there for a bit, and if you look closely, you can see that a green color started to appear. I quickly turned the magnetic stirring on and then off, and a pretty evident color change happened. The reason for this is that indigo carmine is pH sensitive, and under strongly basic conditions, it has a yellow greenish color instead. The upper portion was still blue, because it hadn't fully mixed with the basic part. When the stirring was turned on full though, it all quickly disappeared. I then dumped in a bunch of glucose, and I mixed it until it all dissolved. What was cool now was that when I turned off the stirring, the color changed to an orangey red, and then to a very strong yellow. This happens because on top of being sensitive to pH, it also changes colors based on its level of oxidation. The greenish form was fully oxidized, but the glucose was able to reduce it to its red form, and then to its yellow form. What's also interesting is that with strong stirring, oxygen is mixed in and it can re-oxidize it. This cycle can be repeated many times, and it's called the chemical stoplight, because, well, the colors are the same as a stoplight. In the future, I plan to explore this reaction in more detail, but for now, I'll move on to the edible chem part. Okay, I'm now ready to try dyeing food with it, but before I do that, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. 
As I mentioned earlier, NordVPN is an easy to use service that helps keep your information safe when you're using the internet. What it basically does is create an extremely secure and encrypted connection between you and any of their thousands of servers. Their servers then decrypt your data, relay it to its destination, and then re-encrypt the data that's sent back to you. They also have zero data logging, so this entire process is completely anonymous. Effectively, this means that anyone between you and NordVPN, like your internet service provider, or just the guy that runs the free Wi-Fi at your local coffee shop, can't just take a look at everything that you're doing. For me, this service is particularly useful because I tend to use free Wi-Fi a lot, and on top of this, the internet at my new workplace is provided by the building owner. I have absolutely no control over it, and it means that technically, if he wanted to watch and log anything that I do, he could. On top of this, just like with public Wi-Fi, it could also be possible to sniff out my passwords. With NordVPN though, all my data is encrypted and it makes it almost impossible to track what I do. In general, if you're someone who takes privacy seriously, I highly recommend signing up for NordVPN. They also support both desktop and mobile, so you can secure all your devices. I personally run it on my phone and both my work and home computer. They're offering all my viewers 77% off three-year plans, which you can get by going to nordvpn.com slash nilred, or by clicking the link in the description. Okay, so before dying food, the first thing that I needed to do was make a concentrated solution. This was easily done by adding about 50 milligrams of indigo carmine, followed by 5 mils of water. Then I just shook it up until it was all dissolved, and it was good to go. I was originally planning to just dye normal things like soda or jello, but I felt like that was a little lame. I decided that it would be much more interesting to color some foods that normally shouldn't be. I had a lot of options to choose from, but I ended up just making a really gross breakfast. The first step was to color some margarine, so I scooped some into a bowl and then melted it in a microwave. I added the dye, but it didn't mix very well because it isn't very soluble in oil or fat. There is a small amount of water in it though, that it's able to dissolve into. With a whole bunch of mixing, I was eventually left with a uniform color. To get it to solidify again, I alternated between putting it in the freezer and mixing it up. It ended up getting a lot thicker, but it never fully solidified like it was before. Then I moved on to making some scrambled eggs. I cracked a couple, mixed them up thoroughly, and added the dye. I initially only added 5 drops, but the color wasn't as strong as I wanted it to be, so I added some more. Because the eggs were already yellow, it became a dirty green. When I felt I was happy with the color, I added some salt and pepper. At the same time, I had prepared a pan by oiling it with the colored margarine. The only issue though, was that the high heat very quickly destroyed the blue color, which was kind of sketchy. To a certain extent, this will also happen in the eggs, and I actually have no idea how safe it is to eat its thermal degradation products. In any case, I went ahead and added the eggs, and I just moved everything around with a spatula. The heat was a bit too high here, and I'm also horrible at cooking, so yeah. When they looked about ready, I took them off the stove and temporarily put them on the side. As the eggs were cooling a bit, I quickly popped a couple pieces of bread in the toaster. When they were done, I covered them with a good layer of the blue margarine, and I cut them in half. I ended up putting on a lot more margarine than I normally would, just to make the color more evident. Then I added my super tasty and totally not gross eggs to the plate. I'm not sure if you guys feel the same thing, but just looking at these eggs really grossed me out. I knew the only difference was color, but it still kind of made me a bit nauseous. I was honestly really surprised how much it grossed me out, considering it was just a color change. I think it just altered my expectations of what it would taste like. The fact that it looked so different, but I knew it still tasted the same, kind of threw me off. I still ended up giving everything a small taste to just to be sure, and it was all normal. I'd never be able to eat a whole meal like that though, and I would definitely need to be blindfolded or something. Anyway, that's about it for the video. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you on the next one. As usual, a big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Everyone who supports me can see my videos at least 24 hours before I post them to YouTube.
Also, everyone on Patreon can directly message me, and if you support me with $5 or more, you'll get your name at the end like you see here.